वालेकुम ताहिर साहब कैसे हैं आप जी वाइफ डॉक्टर साहब तो मुझे जरा एक मिनट देते हैं कि मैं लाइव ब्रॉडकास्ट जी डॉक्टर आर यू रेडी नाउ आप म्यूट है म्यूट है अनम्यूट कर लें जी तय साहब आई एम रेडी अच्छा जी एक दफा जरा स्क्रीन शेयरिंग चेक कर लें फिर मैं जी श्योर मैं चेक करता हूँ एक मिनट जी जरा एक आधी स्लाइड मूव करें ताकि आ गई है स्क्रीन शेयरिंग आ रही है जी एक एक आधी स्लाइड मूव करें तो बस इंशाल्लाह फिर शुरू करते हैं जी तय सब एम आई ऑडिबल और इज द स्क्रीन विजिबल यू आर ऑडिबल द स्क्रीन आपने भी है स्टार्टेड स्क्रीन शेयरिंग बट आई कॉन्ट सी द स्क्रीन ओके मेरे एंड पे इट्स वर्किंग ओके जस्ट गिव गिव इट अ मिनट एंड इफ इट डजंट वर्क टू माय स्क्रीन आराम से आराम से करें हां आ गई है आ गई है ठीक मैं जरा स्लाइड स्लाइड्स को मूव करने लगा तो आप वो भी देख लीजिएगा कि इट्स वर्किंग फाइन जी जी इट्स मूविंग इट्स मूविंग माशाल्लाह ठीक है चल चल ठीक हो गया अब आप अनशेयर कर दें सो दैट आई कैन स्टार्ट मैं सब देख सकूं
कुछ लोग आ रहे हैं मैं जरा इनकी एंट्री कर लू फिर मैं एक ही दफा अनाउंसमेंट करूंगा जी ठीक है जी वी आर वेरी डाउन बिस्मिल्लाहमान इब्राहिम इन द नेम ऑफ अल्लाह द मोस्ट ग्रेशियस एंड द मोस्ट मर्सिफुल अस्सलाम वालेकुम लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन अ वेरी वार्म वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान सोसाइटी ऑफ सिविल इंजीनियर्स दिस इज लेक्चर नंबर 55 एंड आई वेलकम सम न्यू पार्टिसिपेंट्स होम आई एम सीइंग फर्स्ट टाइम सो फॉर देयर इंफॉर्मेशन आई जस्ट वुड लाइक टू इंफॉर्म देम that uh, this is a, this is series these i mean these lecture are the series of lectures which pscee is holding every month for the benefit of young and uh, experienced civil engineers by attending these lectures you can earn uh, uh, a cpd point 0.5 per lecture and uh, and it also keeps you abreast with the advancing knowledge in civil engineering so and uh, apart from that uh, there are other benefits also to join the society that you can see on our website now before i saw, start with the lecture and introduce the speaker to you uh, there are certain rules which we have to follow and uh, it's my duty as per instructions of pakistan engineering council to read those rules for you the first one is all registered participants for cpd points must appear live on the webcam however for the ladies it's their choice if they wish they can keep their faces covered but have to appear live on webcam during the lecture microphone of all the participants except that of the speaker shall remain in mute position in the end we will have question answer sessions of 20 minutes and I am I audible to everyone. Doc, sir, can you hear me? Yes, Tai sir, you are audible. I can hear you. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, in the, I was just uh, uh, telling you that at the end there will be a twenty minutes question answer session, and uh, for the questions you will have to type in the chat box. as the facility for asking questions through microphone has been withdrawn by the board of directors of pakistan society of civil engineers due to some uh, technical reasons so this was these were the rules and regulations now i will come to the lecture today's topic is practical aspects of pile foundations design and construction and today's speaker is dr muhammad irfan and i am really honored to present to you dr irfan today in lecture number 55 today's uh, uh, as you know uh, for the last two lectures we have uh, made a practice to reduce uh, to very briefly introduce the speakers just to give him more time uh, for delivering his lecture and to the question answer session as we have a constraint of 2 hours uh total time uh, constraint a, a, a total time constraint is of 2 hours so we want to give more time to uh, to the lecture and to the question answer session so dr mohammad irfan he did his bachelor's and masters in civil engineering from uet lahore uet university of engineering technology based in lahore in 2008 and 2011 respectively and he did his phd from university of tokyo of japan in 2014 during his career he has been a teacher in uet lahore and university of tokyo he has been practicing geotechnical engineering as a freelance consulting engineer before starting his own consulting company where he is currently self employed as chief executive of officer his areas of skill are geotechnical design of dams slope stability and 
landslides and uh, geotechnical instruments and sensors, geotechnical investigations and design of civil structures, performance-based design and research and development. To his credit are 23 international publications which he has authored and co-authored. So this was the very brief introduction of Dr. Sa. Now I will give the floor to him and he can start his lecture. Dr. Sa, kindly, the floor is yours and please start your lecture. Thank you very much, Thay uh, for the kind introduction. Let me just try and share my screen. Just give me a second. Uh, Thay is the screen visible? And in full screen, is it visible? Yes, it's visible and you are very much uh, clearly audible. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, the topic of today's discussion, as I shall be explained, is going to be some practical aspects of the Pile Foundation design and construction. Uh, although I initially planned to uh, broaden the discussion to uh, both the design and the construction aspects, but I'm afraid uh, while I was compiling the uh, content for this presentation, uh, I had so much to discuss regarding the design aspects that uh, the construction aspects I might not uh, not be uh, able to cover in detail over here. So uh, what I'll try to do is uh, <clears throat> to probably be talking more in depth about the design things and a few practical aspects of the construction. Uh, this is how I've uh, organized my presentation today. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about some typical piling applications, what are the different places where the piles are used, uh, and then moving on from there, how to characterize the soil, the site from where you have to, uh, where you have to install the pile foundations. Uh, so I'll, I'll not be going too much into uh, the theoretical aspects, I'll try to talk more from the practical aspects. Uh, what this discussion you'll find is, uh, probably at the end of the discussion, some of you might be thinking that you might not have as many as answers than the questions. So probably what I'll just try to do is to give you a food for thought on some new aspects that you, most of you might not have came across previously. So uh, that's going to be uh, the main agenda of this discussion. Similarly, uh, I'll talk next about some pile design considerations, but even in this, you'll not see many equations. Uh, what you'll see is, uh, some practical aspects regarding the design and some new aspects that you might not have uh, discussed before. Uh, then we'll talk briefly about the pile load tests and uh, something that I that's pretty close to my heart, that's pile instrumentation, uh, what it is about and how it can be done. And then I'll, if I'll have time, I'll ha I've added a few concluding remarks. So Moving on, uh, let's see what the what pile foundations are, what and what are some of the typical applications where pile foundations are used. Uh, there are different applications, as you would probably know, uh, where pile foundations are used. These are marine and harbors where uh, they are not only used as foundation structures, uh, but they are also used often to retain the <clears throat> to retain water, like to construct water dams. Sir, uh -huh. G. Uh, are you moving the slides or are you, it's the first still you are going on with the first slide? No, I am on the fourth slide right now. I don't know if I don't think the slide is moving. Okay, let me let me just see it. just a second. Okay, uh, that's up. It should work now. Please confirm. Is slide number no. four visible? No, 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 it is still the first slide. Just a second. Yeah. G, what is this move? No, it is not. 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 Slide show. Ji, Tarsa, confirm Kijiga. 
ये अभी स्लाइड शेयर नहीं हो गई या शेयर जी जी अब हो गई है अब ये कौन सी है ये स्लाइड नंबर फोर है क्या मरीन एंड हार्बर ये मरीन एंड हार्बर की है स्लाइड ओके मैं इसको चेंज करने लगा हूँ जरा बताइएगा आपके पास क्या ये जी क्या स्लाइड चेंज हुई आपके पास नहीं हुई जी अभी भी नहीं हुई क्या नहीं हुई जी हो ओके अब ओके और मुझे मुझे एक अब रोड्स एंड ब्रिजेस ठीक है मुझे एक और चीज भी कंफर्म कीजिए क्या ये रेड कर्सर आपको विजिबल है क्या बिकॉज आई एम ट्राइंग टू यूज अ पॉइंटर तो क्या ये विजिबल है स्क्रीन के ऊपर ये रोड ओके आई एम गेटिंग अ फ्यू कमेंट्स के पॉइंटर इज विजिबल सो ताय साहब आपकी इजाजत से आई एम गोइंग टू मूव अहेड इफ इट्स फाइन जी आई कैन नॉट हेयर ताहिर साहब सो एम आई ऑडिबल टू एवरीवन क्या आप चैट में अगर लिख के मुझे बता सकते हो ओके सो आई एम गोना कंटिन्यू आई आई थिंक शायद ताहिर साहब का शायद लाइन ड्रॉप है तो आई शुड वेट फॉर हिम मे बी Let me just see एक second. I have come back ji. Sorry there was an interruption. Okay, okay, no problem. No problem. So Tahir sir, I am getting comment comments from the audience that uh, it's all fine. They can see the screen. They can see the pointer. So I am going to move ahead with your ijazat if that's fine. Inshallah ji. बिल्कुल जी बिल्कुल चले. ठीक है जी. So uh, we were talking about marine and harbors, the use of the piles over there, and as you can see on the right side. uh these piles are used uh for for multiple purposes uh they can be used for retaining for segmenting for making coffer dams uh and <clears throat> we we often use them in the roads and the bridges as well uh there are buildings and the storage tanks they're basically used uh, in the, in the foundations as you can notice in these figures and this is probably what we are going to talk more about in today because our discussion is mainly going to revolve more about the use of piles as foundation uh, uh, as foundation so we are going to mainly talk about the foundations so you'll see more of this uh, in today's discussion uh, bs there is an, an, an another important use which is in the earth retaining structures uh, that's again uh, a, a detailed science in itself but i don't think that i'll have time to go more into its detail today uh, and just to just to sum it up th th this is how the piles that actually exist in uh, in our built environment something that we are not able to comprehend and imagine many a times you can imagine that there is a, there is a building and beneath the building there are a number of piers something like this which are actually existing there why 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 this figure fascinated me was because this is the perspective reality uh, we civil engineers we uh, are fascinated by the superstructures because we can see them and often times uh, we cannot see uh, what is beneath the ground so uh, we are unable to comprehend its scale and uh, <clears throat> and get an i real idea of it and uh, not only this in today's day and age uh, we have a lot of computer softwares and we can use them to create this kind of a perspective uh, in our numerical modeling softwares as well so that's a, a quick overview of uh, what the piles are about uh, what where they are applied now <clears throat> the whenever you are going to use piles uh, at any at any project uh, the first important step is to characterize the soil 
uh, what do we mean by characterization is to get an idea of what kind of soils are there and because the behavior of the pile in each type of soil is going to be different. So <clears throat> that's one of the most uh, important and the foremost step in anything. But let's look at it from this, from this angle. Uh, we look at the development of different things over the last hundred years, let's say, we would see uh, a significant change in the telephone from uh, in, in, in hundred years. In the similar way, we look at uh, aeroplanes or cars. We see the industry has changed altogether. In these hundred years, the basic form factor of all these things have changed. This is how much it has evolved. But when we talk about site characterization, what has changed over the last hundred years? Yes, this is a picture from 1902, and this is of the kind of tools that were used probably in the early part of the 19th century. And we basically use similar kind of penetration testing even today. Yes, there have been modifications. There are advanced sciences, the advanced uh, technologies which are available, but how commonly widespread they are in the industry is a big question. So you can you can get an idea that this uh, the widespread application of characterization, soil characterization means has not evolved too much over the last hundred years. And then uh, if you look in the, into the textbooks, they don't do us a big favor as well. Uh, you, the most of the textbooks that you would find, uh, you would see that pile foundations, whenever we are being talked, uh, they are being talked mainly in a single soil type. Uh, they are mainly either being talked of as pile foundations in clay soils or in sand soils, uh, or maybe in rocks. Uh, it's very hard to find textbooks where you would find more than one soil layer. This example is probably one of the very few that you would find in, in textbooks where you would find more than a single soil layer. So <clears throat> this is how the textbooks present the piling knowledge or the pile design knowledge uh, to us. Uh, but this is how the reality is about. Uh, in the books you are reading, simply uh, the, the pile foundation in clay or in sand only, but in reality, it's, all, it's most of the times, it's a layered soil structure with alternating layers of different kinds of soils. Now, how are these, uh, how to integrate those things into our practical projects uh, is, is really challenging. For example, you can see if we have a pile here, uh, now this pile is going through sand layer, there is a silt layer here, there is again a sand layer, and it's resting in sand as well. Uh, when you compare it with uh, this, this one, for example, so there's an altogether different layer that is, that is there. And then groundwater table also plays a big impact. For example, there is a groundwater, ta groundwater table that you can see over here maybe, but what about this layer? Uh, this layer is probably under artesian pressure and uh, there is a certain head. So if you puncture it, the groundwater table may rise above, uh, uh, above the ground surface. So how is this pressure of water, how is this hydrostatic pressure going to impact the behavior of the pile in it? This is something that you generally not find in the textbooks. This is what the real world is about. So how can you comprehend, uh, how can you understand the theory from the books and how can you apply it practically in the field is the big gap that we have to, uh, that we have to see. And um, okay, if you think that this is what is close to the reality, then let's consider this example, for example. Now in this example, it, it's even more complex. Uh, this is probably for, uh, <clears throat> for the construction of a bridge. This is the plan view of the bridge. And this is the cross section of how you're gonna find things here. Uh, and in this cross section, you can see on this left abutment and on this right abutment, the stratum is totally different. Um, over here, you would have predominantly clay type material. Over here, you predominantly have sand and gravel type material. Now, this is what reality is about. Uh, when we look into the textbooks, you won't find this. You would, you would find a big gap from the reality. You would find probably a big disconnect. So the real art is how you're going to, as an engineer, you're going to bridge that gap. 
uh, and <laughs> apply the basics and the fundamentals that you have learned from there and apply and connect it into the uh, into the into the reality that's the that's a real challenge uh, and you can see if we say that there are four uh, of uh, there are four peers that are to be constructed for this bridge structure so for these four peers all are to be formed on a different soil layer um, and uh, how are you going to design for it is 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 the real challenge that's what the reality is pretty much about and then there are other important things that you as an engineer need to consider uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the site characterization. So let's assume this example of a site where there is a clay layer at the top and uh, there is a gravel layer uh, that's at the bottom and you want to construct a pile which is between uh, which is going to penetrate the clay layer and is going to rest on the gravel layer. And then there are a couple of sand seams in between. So as an engineer, you need to understand that the site characterization, as we say, it has different meaning for the designer and for the contractor. If you are a designer, you might only be focused on certain things, which, and you might not consider the things which can be important for an executioner. But for the success of a project, it is important that as a designer and uh, as a designer, you need to understand what the challenges a contractor might face and uh, you design accordingly. So if you are a designer of, of this kind of a project, so you would probably be interested in what is the depth of the gravel top uh, because you would probably be interested to rest your pile at on the gravel. So you would want to derive some toe resistance from here. So you would be interested in this. For you, shear strength of the clay would be important because you want to derive some skin friction from this clay. So whatever is the shear strength, uh, that's going to play a part in the skin friction that you are going to derive. And uh, for you, it's going to be important that what is the density and the friction angle of this gravel layer. And similarly, if there is groundwater table, you would want to take into consideration. And as a designer, it is important for you that what is going to be the loading direction? Is it going to be axial uh, or lateral? So these are the factors that are going to be important for you as a designer. But if you are going to execute this thing, this is the thing that we often miss in projects. So you, you, once all the designing and the desk study is being done, it's only this side which is being considered. And a lot of times these things are not taken into consideration. For a contractor, there can be a lot of other things which are important. He would be interested to understand what are the flow rates in, uh, into the borehole from the sand seams and the gravel. So because whatever is the water that is coming into the borehole, accordingly, he has to have measures to stabilize the borehole. So that's what is of uh, paramount importance for, for a contractor. And not only this, these sand seams, which are not as important for uh, the designers most likely, uh, play a big role, can play a big role for the contractors. They have to see uh, that th there might be a borehole collapse in these zones, depending upon the characteristics and the rate of inflow. So how is he going to stabilize those is going to be a challenge. What is the consistency of the clay? Because depending upon the consistency, uh, you might have to adjust your drilling techniques accordingly. Uh, the depth of the groundwater table is important and existence of joints. And so all these things, so many of these things that designers might not even consider for uh, at, at the design stage. And just because these things are not understood well at the design stage, there are problems when the uh, when the project is being executed. So what is important for us is to uh, to have more successful projects is that all these perspectives need to be understood well. When we talk about site characterization from the all these perspectives need to be understood in a in, in a better way. On, on similar lines, let's consider another example. So there is a significantly thick overburden layer followed by a hard rock at the bottom. Now, in this case, there was a borehole that we did over here. This yellow line indicates the borehole that we did. Now, if the designer is basing his design based on this information he received from this borehole, so a pile of this at this location might be okay, but a pile which if executed at this location might not be okay. 
Now, how this kind of variability is going to be taken into consideration in any project? Because these knowing these uncertainties and be prepared for them is important for the success of any project. And again, you look from the designer's perspective and you look from the contractor's perspective, the the things are different, which they, which are important for them. So as a designer, you would think that what is the depth of the sound rock? Because you are going to prepare a model, a geotechnical model, where you would uh, where you would need the depth of the sound rock for this. And in a similar way, what is the strength of the rock and the discontinuity there? Um, what is how you can classify this overburden? Can you classify it as clay or sand or gravel or whatever? So that's important for the designer, but look what, what is important from the contractor's viewpoint. From the contractors, yes, the depth is important, but it is also important for him that when he is going to do a pile, what is the frequency and size of these boulders that might be there in, in this overburden? That is something which is of least importance for the designers, but for a, for a contractor, that's, that's important. So again, at the design stage, if these things are not taken into consideration, these can cause big problems and big variations in the projects as, as, the, uh, as the project moves ahead. Similarly, the contractor is going to be concerned with the dr drillability and the general hardness of the rock that is there. Uh, and is the overburden, can it stand open or do you need to support it either by installing a casing or by wet drilling or whatever? And again, uh, it's important that is there any water ingress from the overburden into the borehole? Because if there is water ingress, you need to stabilize it. So that's also uh, an, uh, an, an important thing. So <clears throat> and another important thing is that uh, at the time of investigation, we determine some geotechnical properties and design based on that. We need to remember that it is not necessary that when the pile is installed, actually installed in the same soil, the soil properties or the rock properties remain the same. There is often deterioration in the properties. And again, there is, uh, it is also possible that the pile regains the strength with time. So the load carrying capacity increases over time as well in certain kinds of soil. And in some other kinds of soil, the load capacity decreases with, with the passage of time. How, as a designer, you are going to take, consider all these things uh, in, in your design is, again, uh, fairly, fairly important. <clears throat> now, it all starts with soil investigation, the geotechnical investigations. And generally, what we say is that uh, the overall cost for that is invested for geotechnical investigations of any project in the developed societies, it generally ranges up to 1% of the overall cost of construction. Now, th this graph, uh, which I've taken from the paper by Clayton, uh, on the x-axis, you would find it's the cost of geotechnical investigation with regard with regards to the overall cost of the construction project. And the y-axis is the total increase in the construction cost because of the unforeseen that were encountered during the execution of the project. So you can see that typically it's 1% of the cost. And uh, if you invest 1% of the project cost in geotechnical investigations, uh, the unforeseen can be significantly higher. But if you start investing more money into knowing more about the subsoil performance, uh, the, these unforeseen can keep on decreasing. So if you invest more money, there is going to be more confidence as a designer that one would have, and there would be less variations during the life cycle of the project. There would be less unforeseen during the life cycle of the project. So, so that's... Uh, so these are some of the things that one need to consider. And at the end of the day, our goal is to get a good pile performance. And that good pile performance is not possible uh, until unless we take care of all the construction issues and also the design issues. So both of the, without understanding both about the construction and the design issues, it is not possible. So if we talk about the construction issues, you have to be very careful about the integrity of the pile. How good is the contact between the pile and the surrounding soil, particularly with regards to when we talk about the bottom cleaning of the pile. Um, similarly, how good is the interface 
friction between the between the walls of the borehole and and the concrete itself and uh, from the geotechnical design viewpoint uh, what are the boundary conditions that we are assuming and what are the properties of the soil or the rock that we are using now the problem here is because of uh, because of us not being able to understand it very well uh, the many current design approaches uh, what they do is they group uh, these construction and the design issues together and once uh, because of this uh, because of this kind of grouping uh, this leads to a lot of understand misunderstanding a lot of conservatism that is that is often there so i'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we go ahead in this uh, slide so let's talk a little bit about uh, the pile design considerations now what is pile design and before we, it, it's important to see why even talk about the pile design. Uh, we think that the pile design and the analysis techniques are relatively well established. They are verified globally and generally conservative. Uh, pile installation is very well established. So you have well established methods by which you can drill, uh, you can cast a pile. And pile testing methods are also uh, fairly well established. Then why is it even important to uh, talk about the pile? So if all the above is correct, then piling should be a low risk, low risk business, and it should be an efficient process. Uh, we would have been optim, we would have optimized this practice significantly. Uh, so if if this is the case, uh, why do we even need to talk about the pile design? But this is not true. The reality is that we still get it wrong. We often choose the wrong pile type. Uh, we often and de design based upon capacity rather than the settlement. Now that's a very important topic and I'll elaborate more about it. But uh, it is important that we only talk about the pile capacity most of the times. We don't talk about the pile settlement and neither we understand how the pile is going to settle under those loads. So that's a big gap uh, in our engineering practice. Uh, we often have insufficient information. Uh, so something of an example that I just gave earlier of an overburden uh, overlying a rock. So we there, there might be a rock dipping significantly and you might not have been able to discover it in geotechnical investigation. And that insufficient information can lead to a project failure. Uh, whatever design assumptions we make, often at times during execution, uh, it's not possible or we don't even confirm those design assumptions. Uh, and the, the installation process is not managed most of the times. In many projects, uh, the pile execution, uh, it's a lot of discussion and deliberation goes on till the design stage. But once it goes in the execution stage, uh, there is not much effort or investment put in its management. And uh, that causes a lot of problems. Uh, so, and <clears throat> it's also that we don't do enough pile testing. Uh, we think that we did testing in the design phase. Now there is probably no requirement of the, uh, testing in uh, post-construction verification testing. So that can, that leads to problems in the long, uh, in the life cycle of the project. Now, uh, what we can do is we can obviously uh, do better than this. Uh, we still lack good understanding of the pile behavior. So that's why it is important to discuss it more about it. And just to elaborate it a little bit more, that uh, what I mean by this is our poor understanding of the pile, pile behavior. Uh, th this graph is fairly interesting one. So what they did was uh, they conducted a pilot test, and this is the actual test result from that pile load test. Uh, and in this pile load test, you would see the actual pile capacity was probably around 2,800 tons, 2,800 kilonewtons, and uh, out of which this shaft capacity is around 1,800 kilonewtons. So this is the actual pile load test once they perform, they observed this behavior. But before the performance of the test, they asked a number of experts, they gave them the soil strata and they gave them the geotechnical uh, parameters and they asked them to predict what do you think will be the capacity of the pile. And you would see this is again from the same paper, research paper by Clayton, 
uh, all of these experts came up with very different estimates of the pile capacity. So this just reinforces the point that I was making in the previous slide that our understanding of pile behavior is not as good. There, is, there cannot be such a significant widespread gap of understanding in the geotechnical capacity of how the pile, piles are going to behave. This is such a huge difference in our, in our understanding that exists. And that's not the only case. I'll, in, the, in the following slides, I'll just, I'll just share a few more uh, ex such examples. And in the developed world, what they do is fairly interesting. What they do is uh, they hold such prediction events. So they're, they are going to perform a pilot test. And before the pilot test, they give all the data to people around and they ask them to come up with the load settlement curves. So before the test, they give the geotechnical data to people and they ask them to come up with the load settlement curves as per their own understanding and as per their own experience. So uh, there was such a prediction event that was handled in 2018 in Sweden. And uh, this red line shows the actual pile load test data. And all these other lines indicate the predictions that were made by the predictors. So again, that gives you an idea that such a vast difference exists uh, in our understanding. Because if our understanding of the pile behavior is close, so at least 50, 70% of the, these predictions should have been fairly close to, to the actual pilot test, but it is, it is not the case. And there are many other examples as well. There was a similar kind of an event in 2015. This uh, red line indicates the actual pilot test data and all other lines are the predicted uh, load settlement response. And you can see the actual pile in this case behaved better than most of the predictions. So all of these predictions, uh, most of these predictions are taking lesser load compared to the actual pile. Uh, this is contrary to what we observed in the previous case. In the previous example that I had shown, uh, mostly predictions were the pile would behave much better and the actual pile behaved uh, poorer. So, so it's not that our biases are one-sided. Uh, it can go in either direction. Uh, and in this event, they did something, something more interesting. Uh, what they did was uh, they asked the people, okay, this is your prediction of the load settlement response, but what is your estimate of the pile capacity? Because at the end of the day, in our general practice, this is the only thing that people are concerned about. Generally speaking, people rarely are interested in knowing the load settlement response. What they generally are focused on is pile capacity. So they ask those predictors to come up with their prediction of the pile capacity. Now, there is one important difference that you need to remember. In this case, they gave us, when they were making the predictions of the load and settlement, so basically they provided them with the geotechnical data and they asked them to predict the load settlement curve. But when I'm talking about the pile capacity, now that is, <clears throat> in this case, they gave them this red line. Now the, that's after the completion of the test. Now the test has been completed and we have that <clears throat> same red line here and they ask them to predict what is their understanding of pile capacity, what capacity value should be chosen. And you would see that of the 29 participants who responded, there was a huge scatter of understanding. The, some people uh, suggested to pick up a pile capacity of around 6,000 kilonewtons and up to as much as around 8,500 kilonewtons. So such a wide spread of the understanding of pile capacity that exists. So there is no pretty, pretty much no global definition of pile capacity that exists. And, and this is a similar example where again, in a prediction event, they ask people to predict uh, the pile capacities. And you can see there is a huge scatter of the pile capacities predicted by people uh, compared to uh, uh, what, can actually, what can actually be taken. So what it leads to is that pile capacity is not a geotechnical reality. Uh, we overemphasize about the capacity of the pile. 
well while talking about the pile design and it's not a geotechnical reality and that's not what i am saying uh, this is an excerpt from uh, the book by philenius uh, and uh, what he says is both the shaft and the toe resistance develop due to movement what it means is that when you are applying load on the pile and when you are trying to push it into the ground the resistance develops because of the pile being moving inside the ground in the ideal ideal elastic plastic load movement case something of like this blue line so this is an ideal elastic plastic load movement case <clears throat> the magnitude of the movement beyond small values necessary before the plastic state is reached is not important what it means is that this is probably the failure point it is very easy to determine the failure in this case of elastic plastic response you can easily determine the failure over here so that's that can easily be determined here but in this elastic plastic response the movement before the failure is so little that that's not much significant but however in most cases of shaft resistance and in every case of toe resistance a stand alone ultimate resistance value does not exist the resistance is always a function of the movement so this black line is pretty much close to the reality what he is talking about in most of the cases there is an a stand alone value of ultimate resistance does not exist how can you tell what is the capacity over here yes there are different methods we'll talk more about it in the following slides but it's there is no singular value of capacity that exists this is why our understanding our global understanding of pile capacity is so varied and uh, once you see in those prediction events people come up with all broad range of pile capacity so according to him this pile capacity is a fudge concept that's something that we should not use pretty pretty often uh, in in our design so uh, although i'm uh, quoting philenius who says pile capacity is a fudge concept but since that's something which is more commonly understood by the people so i'm still using the term capacity but i'm using it in inverted commas here so that you you get an idea that this is not what i actually mean so talking about the geotechnical capacity of the piles uh, as we know that uh, piles derive their capacity uh, from two sources the one is the shaft and the other is the toe and when if we want to determine the axial capacity uh, the ultimate capacity of the pile that is the maximum load that the pile can take before failure so what we do is we determine the ultimate shaft resistance and we add up the ultimate toe resistance so what is whatever is the maximum shaft resistance that the pile can offer and whatever is the maximum toe resistance that the pile can offer we determine them and then we just add them up and once we have determined these qs and qb just to be on the safe side we apply a certain factors of safety on it so that's the typical standard procedure that we generally follow but but let's look this is what we generally do in case of uh, geotechnical capacity of piles but what do we generally do in case of civil design let's see what capacity means when we talk about civil design practice what what about other materials so simply put capacity is the load at which the material fails uh, whatever is the load at which the material fails is what we call as the as the capacity of that material uh, now this thing uh, now the, the the problem is that how do we know when the failure occurs how do we define failure now it's fairly simple in case of steel or in concrete you know when the material failed if you are put pulling a, a steel bar in a tension test or if you are compressing a concrete cylinder in a compression test so it's very easy to define a failure but what to do in case of piles how do we define the failure is the real challenge that's uh, that's the real problem that uh, that exists here now let's look at this example for example uh, for instance now right now I, i just want you to concentrate on this red line that is there this is the load settlement graph and in this load settlement graph how can we define the failure yes you can see an offset limit indicated here some of you who might already use this uh, davison's offset offset limit method have some idea about it but 
th those of you who use it would probably already know that there are other methods. There are so many other understandings of this as well. So how do we define the failure is the real challenge. And not only this, uh, there is an added layer of complexity is, uh, to it as well. And that added layer of complexity is that if by some means we can separate this total pile response and we can separate the shaft resistance and the toe resistance from it. Now, we were discussing the ultimate pile resistance and the, we, we were discussing that it's the ultimate skin resistance and the ultimate toe resistance, and then we will be applying factor of safety on it. Now, what is the failure point of this shaft resistance and what is the failure point of this toe resistance? That's going to be much different. So we are saying that the pile is going to, or the overall pile is going to fail at around maybe 15 millimeters of movement. But is the shaft also failing at the same movement? Probably no. The shaft peak value would probably be here. So it means the maximum resistance so of the shaft was derived at around 10 millimeters of the movement. But what about the toe then? Is it the peak value that you are going to consider? or is it something else? So that's the level of complexity that is there generally uh, in, in case of uh, when we try to focus too much on the pile capacity. So what I want to say is that we are overemphasizing on the pile capacity and we don't even know at what, capacity, at what movement the shaft is mobilized and at what movement the toe is mobilized. And whatever I'm telling you here, I'm trying, I'll try to connect it when I go to the near the end of this presentation, I'll try to connect it all over, over, over there. So the, the big question is, what is the settlement um, at which the ultimate shaft resistance is mobilized, generally speaking? So you are applying a load on the pile. It's trying to settle inside. How much movement of the pile is there at which we can say the maximum resistance that we can get from the shaft is there. And now if we move the pile further in, the shaft resistance is going to decrease. And the same question is there for the toe resistance as well. Now, generally speaking, <clears throat> generally speaking, there are some guidelines that you would find in the literature. Uh, literature In the literature, you would find that the shaft capacity uh, is generally mobilized at around 1% of the pile diameter equivalent to movement. So uh, if the when the pile moves, to around 1% of the pile diameter, uh, then that is the point when the maximum shaft capacity is mobilized. In a similar way, uh, they say that toe capacity is fully mobilized when the pile movement is around 10% of the pile diameter. So that's uh, something that you would find in the literature. But you can see there's a significant difference in these two values. So what it tells is that the, when the pile starts moving inside the soil, the skin friction is mobilized much quickly compared to the toe resistance. So uh, let's look at them one by one. Let's look at them separately. How, what is actually the toe resistance and how to determine the peak value, the ultimate toe resistance, how to determine that or how, how it is actually determined. So in order to understand that, we have to look at the same graph here. Uh, that's a similar kind of a graph that I've shown earlier. So this is a schematic illustration, uh, which shows that this is the typical response of the skin friction. This is the typical response that you would get in case of a skin friction. And as I told that the peak value of the skin friction is obtained at around 1% of pile diameter movement, that's where the peak value is generally obtained. But when you talk about the toe resistance, uh, it keeps on going up and up, and there is no clear value where you can say that this is the peak value. Although we are saying that 10% of the pile diameter is the point where you would get the maximum toe resistance, but that's not always the case. Even after that, the this graph keeps on going up and up. Now, the question is, why is this so? why this toe resistance graph keeps on going up and up and it does not come down. And if it does not come down, can we even determine the capacity, the toe capacity? In the formula, we say that we want to determine the ultimate toe resistance. And as I said in the previous slide, ultimate 
toe resistance means that the point at which the toe failure occurs. That's what is meant by the ultimate toe resistance. So we are trying to figure out that what is the point at which the toe failure occur. Is there any point where the toe failure occur? That's the that's the real question. Now that that can be answered by looking into this uh, <laughs> looking into these figures. Now when we talk about the pile toe, pile toe is basically a shallow footing, but placed at a very deep embedment. It's the same as a shallow footing, but placed at a very deep embedment. When we talk about a shallow footing, we are applying the load, and that load that is being applied has a shear plane because of being placed at a very shallow depth, has a shear plane, and it can daylight very easily, and it can fail. But what happens when you put the same shallow footing at a very deep depth at the toe of the pile? When it, you place it at a very deep depth, at a toe of the pile, so what happens is when the load is applied, <clears throat> upon the application of the load, the stress bulb that is developed beneath it, it tries to expand sidewards. It tries to expand sidewards. When it expands sidewards, the soil which is surrounding this pressure bulb, it gets more and more, comp more, and more compacted. It gets more and more dense. And as it keep on becoming dense and dense, there is no possibility that this can fail in daylight and come out something as similar to what, ha what happened in case of a shallow footing. Now, because there is no possibility of this being loaded to failure, we can say this thing that that pile tow capacity can never be achieved in reality. You can keep loading the pile and the tow will keep taking the load. The only thing is that it will keep settling but it will keep on taking the load. It can never fail something similar to what you saw in case of shaft friction. Shaft friction, we saw that there is a clear failure point, but in case of tow, you would never find a failure point besides a few exceptions. So what we can, what we can conclude from this is that there is no that there is no theoretical limit to the geotechnical capacity uh, of, of, of the tow. And just to conclude it, uh, we can say that capacity is the ultimate state, which once developed, the added load does not increase the resistance, but simply results in an additional foundation settlement. So that's what it means. So in this case, we can easily define the capacity, as I was saying. At this once, you, in case of shaft friction, once you reach this point, uh, once you reach this point, when you increase the load, there would be no additional load that is being taken by the, by the shaft, but there would be more and more settlement only. But that is something that does not occur in case of, uh, in case of toes. So the, now the question is, how can we establish this thing? How can we determine this thing? Okay, this is a theoretical graph that I've made here. Uh, that, and I'm telling you that it will always go up and up and there is no definitive failure point like this, but how can we prove that? Can we perform an experiment where we load the pile and after loading the pile, we keep on increasing the load and keep on increasing the load and keep on monitoring the toe movement and prove that this keeps on going up? Is there an experiment that we can do? Now, the problem is that in case of piles, the loads are so high that it is not practically possible to do it. But what you can, what we can do in this case is that we can do this kind of a testing on shallow footings. And if we can prove this thing on shallow footings, we can say that that pile toe would essentially behave the similar way. So that's the the analogy that we are making. So if you look at the literature, you would rarely find, you would hardly find full scale load tests performed even on the shallow footings because of the sheer cost and the scale that is involved there. But there are a couple of studies that have been performed. So what they did was it took shallow footings uh, and you can imagine it as the pile toe. They took a shallow footing of different sizes ranging from 0.25 meter to one meter width of the footing and they applied axial load on top of them. And you can see they applied significantly large axial loads on them. What I mean by this is typically talking about the shallow footings, 
our loads or the contact pressures are in the ballpark range of maybe 200 or even less kilopascals most of the times, but they loaded, it, loaded them to up to 1800 kilo, kilopascals. So, and they saw that, did we see the failure in any case? And you can see that you in, keep on increasing the load and it keeps on taking the load and there is no clear failure point, something similar to what you saw in case of shaft friction. But the question is, okay, that's true for the smaller size footing, but what about the large footing? Large footing, we could only load up to 600 kilopascals because obviously if the foundation size is larger, uh, so for the large foundation size, the stress would become smaller for the same load. So how can we prove that uh, this behavior will not change for a larger size footing? So in order to do this, what they did was they normalized the x-axis of this graph. Uh, they normalized this x-axis means that this settlement on the x-axis, they divided it with the corresponding foundation width. So this settlement, divided by the corresponding width of the footing, we get this graph. So in this graph, you can see that irrespective of the size of the foundation, the behavior is similar. So what we can see is that if a smaller size foundation did not show any signs of failure to a very high load, there is no likelihood or very little likelihood that a larger size footing would behave in, in this way. So that's what we can prove from here. But the other important thing is when you talk about piles, many of you would probably know that how do we define failure? For example, if we pick uh, the ASTM standards, the ASTM standard says it's generally the 15% of uh, the pile dia movement, which they, which they call as the pile failure. So how much movement we have done here? We were able to, we were able to move this shallow footing by around 15% settlement and we did not see any sign of failure. What it shows is, it shows is that the, it, the point that we were trying to make earlier that in case of pile toe, the failure is not possible. Uh, there is no absolute failure. So using the term ultimate pile capacity, or ultimate tow capacity to be precise is not appropriate because in case of tow, you would never get to the ultimate capacity of that tow. Uh, you would always be actually correlating it with a certain uh, uh, with a certain uh, movement uh, with a certain movement. So I'll just skip the slide. So so ultimate tow capacity does not exist other than as a definition of a value at a certain movement. So that's the summary of the, uh, what we have discussed so far. And if I put it in terms of um, some, in, in words of Philenius, he would say, tow capacity is a myth. It's a figment of imagination. It does not practically exist uh, in, in reality. So uh, that was it about uh, the tow capacity. And let's see what, do we mean in case of the shaft capacity? So we have seen that the tow capacity, although we use this term, but it does not practically exist. But what about the shaft capacity? We already said that the shaft capacity does exist. And uh, we, uh, we have seen that in case of shafts, there is a clear failure most of the times. Uh, but how do we calculate the shaft capacity in reality? Now, Shaft capacity is generally a function of the effective overburden stress. And of course, many other factors. These are number of different methods which are used to determine the shaft capacity. Uh, out of all these methods, whatever method that you would use, you are basically determining, determining the ultimate shaft resistance. So whatever method you would use, you would ultimately determine the ultimate shaft resistance uh, from it. And then the ultimate shaft resistance that you have taken, you can then apply a certain factor of safety on it uh, to get your desired results. Uh, but, but the question is that uh, showing you the same example that I've shown earlier, or, okay. <clears throat> but, but the question is what kind of behavior it can, uh, it can show, the shaft can show. Uh, yes, I was talking about this kind of plastic behavior previously, but that was oversimplification of the case. Whatever pile shaft capacity, shaft resistance that we determine, 
it can show different kinds of response. There is a possibility that it shows the elastic plastic response, something like this. So what I mean is that if we have a pile and if we are pressing it in, so the response of the shaft is something like this. But in many cases, it shows a softening response. What it means is it shows a peak value and then it drops rapidly. And in some other cases, it shows a hardening response, means it keeps on gaining strength and does not fail, something similar to what we saw in case of toe resistance. So that's, uh, there is quite a lot of variability. And another challenge in this case is that the movement that is required to mobilize the maximum resistance, skin resistance is different in, case, in, in all these cases. What I mean is that if you look at the softening response, so maybe this is the peak value, and the movement that is required to determine this peak value is around 2.5 millimeter. But if you pick up this elastic plastic response, the required movement to mobilize this might be much different. So in the previous slide, we took an oversimplified example that the shaft resistance is mobilized at around 1% of the pile diameter. That's also not true. That's not always the case. There is a lower bound and there is an upper bound. It is possible that the shaft friction mobilizes at as low as 0.3% of the pile diameter, and it can go maybe up to two or 3% of the pile diameter. So there's a lot different that, that is available. Now, these are the kind of things that generally are difficult to uh, find in, in, in theory. But these are the things which are pretty fairly important for from the designer's viewpoint. And uh, this is a practical example of what I was saying in the previous slide. So you can see uh, that uh, this is a instrumented pilot test that was performed at, at a project site. And in this instrumented pilot test, there are different strain gauges which are involved. Uh, don't worry too much about the layers. Let's say this is layer number one, this is layer number two, and layer number three. Uh, and you can see that the response from, th this is the response from different soil layers. And you can see that the response from one layer can mobilize at around 4.5 millimeters. And the response from the, the ultimate skin friction of another soil can mobilize at 1.5 millimeters. So point is that when you are loading the pile, you need to know that what is the movement that is required to mobilize the skin friction. Because at the end of the day, we are more concerned with will this pile settle more or not? And if we are only focusing on the capacity thing, then we are missing a lot of useful information that is, that is there. Now, how do we determine the shaft friction? As I, as I uh, briefed earlier, there are different methods that we use. Uh, I'll just talk quickly about the beta method that is there. Uh, now, why I talk about the beta method? Because in my opinion, uh, the load transfer, the pile capacity generally follows the principles of effective stress. Uh, and since this is an effective stress method, so uh, this, is probably a better method to predict uh, the pile capacity. In its full form, what you do is uh, you, it, you can use, determine the shaft resistance, and that shaft resistance is uh, C dash, which is the effective cohesion intercept, beta is the, the coefficient, and the effective overburden pressure. And then what you do is you determine the unit shaft friction of each soil segment, and then you multiply it with the surface area of the pile, uh, to determine the total shaft resistance. So that's, you, by, by doing the simple maths, you generally determine the total shaft resistance. Uh, now what happens is uh, that uh, practically, it's a little difficult to determine the C dash. You have to either perform uh, a, maybe a consolidated drain triaxial test. Uh, so that's often omitted. So for this reason, the C dash is often omitted in, uh, in the calculations for simpli so for simplification. And not only this, uh, not only this, uh, we, in case of rocks, uh, because this effective overburden pressure becomes somehow irrelevant. What I mean is that this effective overburden pressure in case of rocks, uh, that does not play a big role because uh, this rocks, because of strong cohesion are self-standing. 
and if they are self standing it means uh, if you are at a shallow depth or if you are at a deeper depth there is effectively no increase in the lateral resistance so in this case we often eliminate this part and we only rely on this cohesion intercept um, and if we only rely on this it becomes alpha method so that's uh, what what we do often case So we have seen what the toe capacity is about. We have seen what the shaft capacity is about. Uh, but so what we, as, as, as I said, what we generally do is we determine the toe capacity, we determine the shaft capacity, and we simply by adding these two up, we can come up with the ultimate capacity. So if we can under, determine it with reasonable accuracy, and if we can determine it with reasonable accuracy, we should get a fair estimate of the ultimate capacity of the pile. But that's not the case. There are different methods that we use for determining the shaft friction and the toe resistance, as I've shown earlier. Now, what the end result is, that the end result is that the ultimate capacity that we determine is can change can vary drastically from person to person and from the method that you have used in your calculation for example these graphs show the unit shaft resistance along the depth for a particular site as calculated by all these different methods and you can see depending upon the method that you pick the unit shaft friction can vary from maybe around 20 kilopascals to as high as more than 100 kilopascals. So this is a significant difference. What in simple words, what I mean is that if I make calculations and if another person make calculations, simply by choosing a different analysis approach, our results can vary significantly. And even if we are not choosing a different analysis approach, by our selection of the design parameters, our ultimate pile capacity estimate can be very different. So what is the solution? Obviously, you cannot do your projects like this. So what you can do to reach a conclusion, you have to verify them in the field. You have to perform a full-scale pile load test to verify this thing in the field. And how do we verify it? We verify it by performing the pile load test in the field. Now, what, what is a pile load test? There are different kinds of it. So I'll just uh, restrict myself very quickly to the static pile load test. Uh, this is what a static pile load test assembly generally look like. Uh, you have a pile at the bottom. You place a large reaction assembly at the top, and you place a hydraulic jack in between the pile and the big reaction at the top, and then you start opening this hydraulic jack. You start opening this hydraulic jack and through the reaction of the top cantilage assembly, uh, you apply load on the pile. You apply load on the pile and once the pile, once the increase on, uh, once the load on the pile is increased, you monitor that how much is the movement that is occurring in this case. Uh, so there are different kinds of assemblies. This is, for example, a reaction pile assembly that is also used uh, for, for such a static load test. Now, so you have determined this is the end product of a pile load test of a traditional pile load test uh, in which we are basically measuring the load and we are measuring the head movement of the pile this is what we are actually doing so we get a load settlement or a load movement curve this is what we what we often get okay we have got the load movement curve now the question is how to determine the capacity what is the capacity that we can determine and uh, in if you if you are to determine the capacity there can again be different cases there can be a case like this in which there is a clear cut failure that the you are increasing the load you are increasing the load and beyond a certain point the pile plunges and if the pile plunges so it's very obvious that probably this is your failure point so in this case, it's very easy to determine the pile capacity uh, in this case. And this is the real pile capacity, as you would say, because this is the maximum load that the pile has taken before it actually fails, which is indicated by its plunging. But in reality, these kind of curves are very, very limited, if not or, or very rare, these kind of curves. So what you actually get is something like this. Now, when you get something like this, so how do you know which point indicates your capacity? 
Then there are different methods. For example, this is one of the most commonly used method, Davison's of offset limit method. So you apply this method, you mark a parallel, uh, you mark a parallel to the initial tangent, and uh, and you where it cuts the graph, you call it as your capacity. So that's that's one of the method, but that's not the only method. There are so many other methods that you'd find in the literature to determine uh, to determine the pile capacity. Now the question is that if there are so many different methods, which method you need to choose? And while I'm asking this question, you would probably remember the prediction competitions that I've shown earlier. There were prediction competitions where people were asked to predict the capacity of the pile. And you saw there was a huge scatter between the results that they got. This is one of the big reasons because everyone has a preference of a different prediction method and everyone has their own comfort level. And when you use any particular method, you would end up with a different estimate of the pile capacity. So on the same graph, if you use different pile capacity methods, so you can come up with different, different results. For example, at this load movement graph, if you use Devison, you would probably get 181 tons of pile capacity and Butler and Hoy gives 185. And then this different methods, by using these different methods, you can, this can go as high as 235 by using Chin's method. So you can see there's a huge scatter of the pile capacity, uh, the end result of pile capacity, depending upon which method uh, you, you pick. And that's not the only example. There are so many other examples. You can do pick up any pile load test data. You can apply different methods and you would see there is a significant scatter of the end results. So if you are using Davison's method, you would probably end up with 314 kilo, kips of pile capacity. And if you are using Chin's method, you can probably get up to 880 kips of pile capacity. So you can see there's a significant difference in the pile capacity uh, that you can uh, come up from different methods. So as th that's the same slide that I had shown earlier. That's the same slide that uh, I had shown earlier. And you can see uh, you can see that the pile capacity from different methods uh, varies significantly. <laughs> I I think you have your mic unmute if you can kindly mute it. Okay, so the, the next question is, I've been talking about, uh, I've been talking about uh, the skin friction and, uh, and the toe resistance. And one question can be that uh, we have this load settlement curve. And in this load settlement curve, is there a way we can separate the skin friction and the toe resistance? Because this is how we perform the pile load test traditionally. We uh, only measure the head movement of the pile. So this is what we do generally. So is there a way we can segregate the head move, the, the shaft friction and the toe resistance? So there are certain ways that have been published in the literature. For example, Mayerhoff pr proposed a method in 1981, uh, according to which, so you can see if this red line shows the pile settlement graph, the actual pile settlement graph that you would get from the field. By following the approach of Mayerhoff, which I cannot go into detail because of limitation of time, you can come up with a shaft friction curve separately, and you can come up with a toe resistance curve separately for this pile load test. So if we can do this, uh, that's going to be a great help. We can understand the behavior of the shaft very well and the behavior of the toe very well. We can understand it separately fairly well, but that's not always the case. This is our, this is by using one method, but there can be another estimate of the same pile capacity, of the, of the shaft capacity and toe resistance of, obtained from the same load test. There are other methods available in the literature by using which someone can say, the shaft is not going to behave in this way, rather it is going to behave like this. And if it's going to behave like this, there is going to be a clear cut failure point. So the shaft is contributing say 1300 tons and the rest is being contributed by the toe. But in this case, you can say the shaft is taking almost the entire resistance is being offered by the shaft. 
So you can see there is a big difference uh, that, that is there. So the, the question is, if we are performing a pilot test and we don't know anything more than the load settlement curve, this red line, as it is traditionally done in the field, then what is the solution? How can we actually determine the real shaft friction and the real toe resistance of, uh, of the pile? In order to do that, we need to instrument the piles. What I mean by instrumentation is what I'm going to show and what I'm going to try and explain in the next section of, uh, of this lecture. <clears throat> so you would see that uh, talking about the pile instrumentation, it is uh, the same pile load test, the same pile, but before casting the pile, we install a few sensors in the pile and then we perform the pilot test in the same way. And if we install those sensors and then perform the pilot test, we are able to get the separate response of the shaft resistance and separate response of the toe resistance. So that's the ultimate goal that we are actually trying to achieve. So <clears throat> what are the sensors? Oh, there are a lot of complications to it, so, but I'm just gonna try and give you a simplified version of, uh, of this. So <clears throat> what kind of minimum instrumentation that we use? So we generally use load cells, and these load cells are basically used to determine the load which is being applied. Yes, we use the hydraulic jacks and we use the, the, uh, the pressure gauges to measure the load, but there are a lot of errors in it, so it's not recommended. Uh, you, should, you should always use a load cell uh, wherever possible. Uh, the other sensors that are involved are typically called the telltales. What these telltales are, <clears throat> these telltales are basically hollow stainless steel pipes which are embedded in, in the pile. And there are stainless steel shafts which are moving up and down in the pile. So by using those, uh, at, at the top head, the, these shafts are connected with LVDTs or the dial gauges. And by using these, you can measure the pile settlement at any depth. What I, what I mean is, generally we are only applying settlement gauges at the pile head. But by using these telltales, we can tell how much is the settlement at the mid of the pile and how much is the settlement at the toe of the pile or at any other location of, for, for that matter. That's what we can do by using these telltales. And in the same way, we, we can have other gauges, something that we call as strain gauges. We can embed those strain gauges in the pile as well. This is how they are attached to the steel cage. And after doing so, uh, you can determine that if you apply 1000 tons of load at the pile top, how much of that load is transferred at this location and next location and correspondingly till the toe. In simple words, if you apply 1000 tons here, it is possible that out of this 1000 tons, only 600 tons are transferred to this step. And as it is going down, that load is reduced to 400 tons, maybe 300 tons, and maybe zero tons. And if this is the case, that the 1,000 tons load applied here is dissipated completely up till this depth, it means this bottom depth of the pile is not contributing anything in the resistance. And if even if this bottom part of the pile was not there, still you would have got the same pile settlement response. So that's what it means. So you can see this is the big benefit. Uh, just by putting sensors here, you can see the load transfer in the pile and you can then uh, remove, uh, you can then uh, optimize your design. I have a few more slides, but I'm just gonna try and move quickly out of it because I think I'm running a bit late. So I'll just try to conclude things quickly. Uh, so this is what those load transfer curves look like in reality. Um, in this case, these are two different examples of two piles. In this case, you can see, this is the pile load settlement response. And these are the load transfer curves as we call it. These indicate that when 1000 kilonewtons of load was applied, 
how much of that load was transferred to two meters depth, four meters depth, and so on. By look, so the maximum 5,000 kilonewtons of load was applied. And out of this 5,000 kilonewtons load, you can see by the time it reaches around mid of the pile, almost <clears throat> only less than 2,000 tons of load was remaining. What it means is this top portion of the pile took more than 3,000 kilonewtons of the load and only 2,000 kilonewtons of the load was transferred to the bottom and the tow resistance could not be mobilized completely. So <clears throat> even if you provided a shallow pile, it probably would have been enough. And in this case, you can see it's a little different. You, if you look at the load settlement curve, you can see there is a clear failure. And this clear failure is somehow indicative in the pile to response as well. In this pile to response, you can see that this 3000 tons of load, which was applied at 3000 kilonewtons of load, which was applied at the top, almost 2000 kilonewtons of that is transferred to the pile to means only 1000 kilonewtons were taken by the entire pile length and only uh, 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 the small portion and great portion of the load was taken by the pile toe. And just to quickly uh, sum it up uh, is one case history of uh, a project that we recently did uh, in Islamabad. Uh, this is a, a mixed use commercial building uh, the, the site is on a hill. There was a cutting and filling on that hill. Uh, there was an, this is the footprint of the building area. Uh, there was an, a nala running downstream of the tow. So basically, uh, this all land used to be a mountain. So they used to cut the, cut the slope and the actual path of the nala, which used to be over here, was moved over the over last 10, 20 years by extending the terrace, it could be moved in this direction. Uh, the geotechnical profile uh, looks something like this. Uh, so you can see, this is from the geotechnical report of the project. You can see uh, the, the old NSL as it was in around 2005 is indicated by this green line. So this was the actual natural soil level. And anything above this soil is what has been characterized as filling. So you can see it's all fill over here, as you can see in this legend as well. Now, we had to place our foundation at this elevation. So when we place our foundation at this elevation, so in this part, we have to do cutting. And in this part of the footprint, we are going to place our footing on the fill. So obviously this fill is the weaker part. So what we did was we put some piles here and perform full-scale pile load tests on them. Uh, so we performed some full-scale pile load tests. And just to give you the kind of possibilities that are possible by using instrumentation, this was the initial plan by, uh, by the client to perform the pile load test. Uh, they had 1,000 mm diameter piles, uh, 45 meters and 40 meters in length. Uh, the, according to the estimates of the consultants, uh, it was going to give around 1,200 and around 1,150 tons. Uh, so in our opinion, we wanted to reduce the pile diameter to save the cost. And we thought that uh, if we provide 760 and 600 millimeters dia piles using the same ge ge geotechnical model as the initial consultant, so this pile capacity, which was initially 1,200, tons, it could be reduced to 800, and our allowable capacity would be around 330 tons. So what it means is that if you are, if we are using, for example, this uh, 600 mm dia pile, now this 600 mm dia pile with 45 meters length, its ultimate capacity should be around 620 tons. What it means is that this, if we, once we perform the test on this pile, this pile should plunge at around 620 tons. That's what the meaning of this thing is. So, but uh, after some uh, after some iterations, we actually performed a pile load test on 600 mm dia pile, which was of 30 meters length. 
So this is important to understand that uh, the 620 tons that we expected was for 45 meters. And what we actually performed was only 30 meters length. So in reality, uh, this pile capacity, when we actually perform the test, should be even lesser. So the, the, the pile should actually fail or should actually plunge at a load much smaller than this 620 tons. So let me just quickly show you, we instrumented this pile. Uh, we put a few strain gauges at different depths uh, indicated by these red dots. Uh, we installed some telltales as indicated at two depths uh, as indicated by these squares. Uh, and then this is an image of uh, the overall assembly that we used. Uh, here you can use, you can see this is the load cell placed on top of the hydraulic jack. Uh, just to be sure of the safety, we installed CCTV cameras so that no one has to go inside the cantilage and it's a little safe. Uh, we measured the deflections by using LVDTs. Uh, we, as a backup, we had some dial gauges also installed. Uh, and we had some telltale rods uh, coming out from this as well. Uh, this graph shows the result, uh, the end result of it. Uh, if you remember, I told you that this is 600 mm dia, 30 meters length, and we are expecting that it should plunge at a load much smaller than 620 tons. But what actually happens is that even when we apply a significant load, even when we apply a load of up to around 800 tons, there is no clear plunging that is involved there. Okay, if we were only monitoring the pile head settlement, that would not have made a lot of sense to us, but we were also monitoring the settlement at the mid of the pile and settlement at the toe of the pile. So by looking at this, you can see that when we apply around 4,000 kilonewtons, that is around four. 100 tons, there is no effect on the pile toe. This purple dot barely moves. It means up to 400 tons of load, no, none of the load could be transferred to the pile tip. So that's how good the pile behaved. And in the same way, these are the load transfer curves. These are the load transfer curves of, of, the, of the same pile. And by looking at the, this load transfer curves, uh, you can see that when we apply this peak load of 800 tons, uh, and on the application of this peak load of 800 tons, most of this load is taken by the top 50 feet of the pile. You can see out of this 800, almost 600 tons of the load is supported by top 50 feet and almost little to no load is transferred to the pile toe. You can see very little or even no load is transferred to the pile toe. So what it means is that even if we had reduced length of the pile, the behavior would have been the same because almost no load is transferred at the pile toe. So that's the benefit of putting some sensors in, in the pile. Uh, you can probably, uh, it would require some, initial investment, uh, but the return of that initial investment can pay big time if you can reduce the length of the pile. Uh, and if you can be more sure about the performance of the pile um, and its behavior. Uh, these kind of things are global standards. They're used worldwide everywhere. Unfortunately, they've not been able to find their place here, but they have their, their due benefit. So that's pretty much it. There are a few concluding remarks, but I'll just quickly skip through it. A uh, few acknowledgements. These are the three gentlemen who I've got significant inspiration from uh, for, for this making this presentation, the work of Professor Harry Polis, uh, Dr. Ben Felenius, and Chris Haberfield. And that's pretty much it from my end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor, for uh, such a nice lecture and with so much insight in it. Now we have some questions. The first question, uh, the first question came on the Facebook, so I will follow the sequence. Uh, 
Doctor, this question has come on Facebook from Shweb Ali Yash. What would be the pile fixity below the bed level for moments? Uh, 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 this is uh, pile fixity is a little is a little off topic. Uh, I think pile fixity is more important when we are talking about the transfer of the moments into the pile and the little loads into the pile. Uh, so there is no straightforward answer to it because again, uh, it depends upon the soil strata. It depends upon the, the 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 layers that are involved. So there are quite a few things uh, which can affect it. So had there been a short answer to it, I would have given it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there is none that I know of. And since it's soft topic, so I don't think I can explain more into it right now. Yeah, that's okay. So, uh, I mean, if uh, qu another question comes, which is not according to the topic, you can just briefly mention that. I mean, if you want, if you don't want to answer the question, which is off topic, it, it's absolutely okay. So now I come to the questions which I have received in the chat box here. It's from engineer Hassanullah. Static pile load takes almost three months, too much time taking. Is that possible? A static load may be replaced by a dynamic test for time safety. I hope you understood the question. Yeah, I think uh, that's a very valid and a, a very, very good point. Uh, static pilot test does take uh, time. Uh, don't think it takes three months as uh, you've stated uh, because either you perform the static pilot test or you perform the dynamic pilot test. The first activity is to cast the pile itself, and that's going to take the same time. So that's not changing. Uh, and this time can be reduced. Uh, the static pilot test, which can take anything like a couple of weeks, probably, uh, the time can be reduced, like because that you start preparing the cantilage uh, during the time in which the pile is gaining strength. So, probably you would be interested to perform the pilot test uh, 14 or 21 days after the pile casting. So once 14 days or seven days have elapsed after the casting of the pile, you can start making the cantilage and that way you can save time. Uh, but uh, dynamic pilot test is a very interesting prospect, I think. Uh, it has a lot of benefits. There are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of literature available which shows that the results of the dynamic pilot test uh, correlate fairly well with the results of the static pilot test. However, one thing is not to be uh, forgotten is the dynamic pilot test, uh, that static pilot test, it's still the gold standard worldwide because nothing can replace a well-executed static pilot test because in this case, there is little to no human intervention that is there. A dynamic pilot test is a very good replacement. In my personal opinion, uh, it should always be performed on the working piles. Working piles, we should not waste time uh, by, uh, uh, by investing on the static pilot test. It can uh, definitely be performed. But can it be performed for the test piles? Uh, that is a little debatable. Yes, people do it. And I think th there is no harm doing it. But if your project allows, and if you have time, doing a static pilot test uh, is is the best way to go, in my opinion. In, uh, you, you know, Next question is from Hamad Azim. He's asking, what is the difference difference of cost between conventional pile load test and sensor based pile load test, and what is the time difference? Okay, the time difference is not there actually because. Uh, it's pretty much the same time. Uh, the pile casting, at the time of pile casting, you just have to put some sensors. The pile cast can be casted in the same way. Uh, and during the test, it has the loading has to be applied as per the ASM standards or whatever standard that you're following. So it's not changed. Uh, the main difference is obviously the cost. Uh, the cost is definitely there, and it depends upon the number of sensors that you are applying. Uh, but like uh, I can give you uh, uh, and, and another big variable is that uh, the, these sensors, uh, since 
pretty much all of them are imported so they have to be paid in uh, a foreign currency and with the currency depreciation situation in pakistan obviously uh, that's another challenge that cost keeps going up and up uh, but you can say that probably if you you are looking somewhere in the ballpark range of maybe 2 to 5 million pkr these days uh, for instrumenting the piles uh, but if in a project you have 100 or 200 piles and if you are able to reduce the length of the of all those piles by only 1 meter let's say or if you are able to reduce the uh, the reinforcement by a small proportion in all those work in all those working piles that cost of of uh, a few millions uh, is offset very easily in the video the doctor but doctor sabit has been difficult for me to keep track of the questions they are coming on the facebook and as well as here anyhow uh, sadi is assisting me here now uh, what was the third what it did yeah now engineer hasamullah is asking is that load cell sensor test available in pakistan yeah it is definitely available i showed you photographs of uh, us being using it at one of the projects so it's definitely available it's uh, uh, its availability is scarce uh, but it is there and then uh, we have another question now next question from mohammad azim he is asking if in raft foundation of some portion if if in raft foundation of some portion has good bearing capacity Well, uh, I think he's referring one ton per square feet, one ton per square foot. Ah, uh, but some region poor fills up to thirty feet is encountered. Can we provide piles on the fill region only, and rest area remain as raft foundation? Eighty percent area raft and twenty percent area have piles. Can't pile change the soil properties? Did you understand the question? Because I was <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I've got what he's trying to say. Uh, okay. I would I would give you a principal answer on this. Uh, in my opinion, uh, you have to forget about what kind of foundations you are using. You only have to think that whatever foundation system that you use, it should control differential settlements in the building. and what needs to be done is that the geotechnical engineer and the structural engineer need to work together fairly closely to see that in different parts of the building is the settlement in different parts of the building within the permissible limit is the angular distortion going to be significantly more or not it does not matter whether you provide shallow footings whether you provide uh, piles yes the behavior of the building the settlement behavior of the building significantly changes but if you understand it well you can do it uh, theoretically speaking you can do it but it is more challenging to do it the right way next question is again from engineer hasamullah he is asking minimizing the length of pile is not only the load another factor is power depth is applicable for lengths how much minimum socketing required if hard strata encounters i don't know what he's asking minimum yeah. minimizing the length of the pile is not only the load i think he is asking uh, length of the pile, shortening of the length of the piles does not only depend on the load but on the scour depth also i think he is trying to ask this thing <laughs> yeah that's that's right obviously uh, uh, there are a lot of other factors uh, like you rightly pointed out scour depth is there so uh, if there is a anticipation of scouring at the pile so obviously you have to go underneath that and consider the skin friction uh, beneath that and you cannot consider the skin friction in that zone so i agree with you that's right so any comment on how much minimum socketing required if hard strata is encountered Uh, obviously there is no generic answer to this uh, depends yeah. from the your loading yeah. conditions and depends upon uh, a lot of other factors so it's there's no general comment on this among the among the participants shahid ijaz is asking sir why we consider a 6 mm of net settlement a failure of pile in load test uh that's something that i have came across very frequently from different people uh, to be honest uh, 
in my journey of learning about piles i have never came across any uh, good uh, international reputable literature which states to take 6 mm of the net settlement uh, you have to see uh, i i give you i give a very simple example and i give a simple example that whatever the structure that you are building either it is uh, a building or a bridge or whatever in which you are giving piles just think from this the building does not know what is supporting what is the foundation system if it is isolated footings if there are shallow footings you for the same building you allow 25 mm of settlement and you are okay with it as a structural engineer we are okay with it uh, but when it comes to pile some people say to restrict the movement to 5 mm only some people say restricted to 6 mm only or any other uh, criteria so in my opinion uh, there is it's not rooted in uh, any strong uh, in any strong theoretical background one uh, reason that i can think of probably where this thing originated is that as i mentioned earlier that skin friction is mobilized fully mobilized normally at around 0.5 to 2% of the pile diameter so it means that if we are talking about uh, let's say 1 meter pile so for 1 meter pile 2% of that would be uh, would be of this ballpark range so i think that might be the origin of this kind of policy in my opinion but i at least don't know of any uh, good reason to follow this if this answers your query now i switch over to uh, facebook we have few questions there also Sh uh, shweb ali yash is asking please recommend some books for pile design and the method of and method for uh, bridge pier design a consultant is designing a pile based on aci 318 moment magnification method uh, can can you repeat the question sir the question is please also recommend some books for pile design and the method for bridge pier design and then he's he's just commenting a consultant is designing the pile based on aci 318 moment magnification method okay uh, i personally uh, prefer using uh, the ash to lrft uh, or the fhwa bridge design guidelines uh i think they are reasonably well updated so i generally follow those so maybe uh you can use those but uh, i think a couple of excellent resources are by these people which i have uh, shown uh, if my slide is still, still visible uh, there is a there is a brilliant book by professor harry polus uh, he is the guy uh, harry professor harry polus for those of you who don't know he is the guy who was the foundation designer of burj khalifa uh so there is a brilliant book by him on uh, for foundation systems for uh, tall buildings i think you can find a lot of uh, good information over there uh, dr chris heberfield on the right side of the slide uh, he's the guy who was a foundation designer of uh, nakheel tower which is a uh, 1.2 kilometers high tower being built in uae right now so it's the new world's largest tower so uh, you can you can follow his work and uh, one of the guy which i uh, really appreciate his work is this dr bent felinius uh, you can just search for his name you will find his website and he has uh, he has written a brilliant book very applied and practical book uh, it goes by the name of the red book basics of foundation design uh, and it's open its digital copy is openly available on his own website and i think these are excellent resources which one, anyone can follow to enhance the knowledge yeah still on the facebook hazar ali tour is asking what would be your recommendation for economical way to predict ultimate load capacity of pile because these instruments are very expensive and most of the time projects have low budget <clears throat> see uh, it's uh, uh, if you if you would have uh, noticed so this is the point that i have tried to highlight in this presentation that we over rely on this capacity thing in reality what we should actually be concerned about is the settlement behavior of the pile 
So uh, if you'd ask me, <laughs> I'm probably not the right person uh, because in my opinion, there is, there is no shortcut way to this. Uh, yes, if you are performing a dynamic pilot test, and again, if the cap trap analysis is done by understanding very well how the actual soil conditions are, so you can uh, probably bypass a lot of instrumentation and get some idea of uh, the units configuration along the different depth. And from this, you can work out a lot of things. Uh, but uh, but I don't think there is any further shortcut to this. Uh, th th that's the way forward, in my opinion. Yeah, now we have Mohammed Askari, same of, uh, still on the Facebook. Why don't we add up anchors in case of steel piles? It can help us to reduce pile length. Please, please suggest. Uh, anchors in case of pile, I, I do not understand. If in if we are talking about uh, the piles which are subjected to uplift, then providing anchors can definitely help. Uh, but if we are talking about piles which are subjected to axial compressive loads, then I don't see any real benefit of those anchors. Yeah, yeah, very well answered. Good. So now we are over with the Facebook, but we have questions uh, on the Zoom chat box again. If there is a question, let me know. Now I switch back here. Now we have, uh, yeah. So we have Mr. Engineer Sir Fraz Manzoor asking, should pile load test be performed before 28 days or before 28 days compressive strength? See, uh, there are two aspects to it. One aspect is that when you are applying the load on the pile, uh, it should not undergo structural failure. And the second component to it is that would the geotechnical resistance fully established? So these are two separate things that need to be looked at uh, in isolation. Uh, if we talk about the structural strength, so if you are, why talking about 28 days? Because at 28 days, often the concrete has gained enough strength. But if your reason of delaying the test is only the concrete strength, then you can use a high strength or, or an early strength gain concrete and perform the test maybe at after seven days, that can be done. But the question is, if you are looking to perform the test on seventh day, let's suppose, is the soil around the pile has stabilized enough that it will develop the same skin friction as it would do at a later time? Generally speaking, when we do a pile, there is disturbance in the surrounding soil. And that disturbance takes some time to settle down. It's different for different kinds of soils. For example, if we talk about sands, and in case of sands, you can probably perform a test fairly early because the disturbance would probably be less. But if you talk about clays, and particularly saturated clays, the in, increase in pore water pressure due to the piling action can affect it significantly. So uh, it depends upon a lot of factors. Uh, you have to see your actual conditions that uh, you're, you're, you're in right now, and you have to decide accordingly. But the short answer is yes, it can be performed uh, as early as you would like. Next question, Dr. Sab is from Shahid Ijaz. He's asking, what are T dash Y, Q dash C, and P dash Z curves? How to calculate these? Kindly refer any software, book, research paper to learn more about them. Uh, in this presentation, I had shown uh, the, I had shown you, let me just try and go back if I can very quickly to give you an idea. Okay, probably it's, uh, I have to just see where they were, but uh, the TZ curves or uh, the QW curves are the same curves. I just had to omit these slides. But uh, so if you are using pile instrumentation, so you want to see that what we are actually trying to do is we are actually putting virtual springs at different depths of the pile. And we want to see the response of these springs when the load is applied on the pile. This is what we are actually trying to see. 
And this is what the structural engineers do in their uh, software models, whatever they use. So we, they are actually interested to know these springs. Right now, what we do is we give those springs based upon theoretical evaluations. And those theoretical evaluations, as we have seen, can be very off. If you are using sensors, you can come up with these kind of curves, which is the skin friction at each depth on the y-axis and the pile shaft displacement at each depth on the x-axis. This is what a TZ curve is called. So we develop these kind of curves for different depths where we have installed the sensors. And these are called the TZ curves. And when we do the same process for the toe, we call it the QW curve. So that's what it is. And again, uh, the book that I referred to was of the book by Felinius. It's a very good resource and it explains all these things in pretty much detail. Yeah. Doc Saab, we have next again, next question from engineer Safraz Manzoor. Engineer Safraz Manzoor. And it's a, it's a construction related question. And he's asking the bore collapses before concreting the pile. What is the alternative solution if the bore depth reduced by 20 feet from the required length? Now, what is the required length? Can you answer, Dr. Uh, obviously, it's a very open-ended question. Uh, if the bore is collapsing, obviously, it's the responsibility of the contractor to make sure how to stabilize it. There are a lot of different methods that are used worldwide. Uh, we in Pakistan, we use the dry hole, we stabilize the hole, we sometimes use casing, uh, but uh, obviously we do not have those good assemblies in through which we can drive the casing inside the soil and then we can pull it out uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the pile com completion. So uh, if we can have these kind of assemblies, globally they are used. So that's how you can stabilize uh, the hole. Uh, but if the hole has already collapsed, uh, so, so it's it's uh, again depends upon your project. Uh, you can you have a sister pile next to it? Uh, can you redo the same bore and uh, complete your pile? So it depends what your situation is, and you can decide accordingly. I will just like to add, Doctor Saab, with your permission, that if the bore is collapsing, it is basically a construction problem, and uh, there are few things. Uh, I mean, if it is collapsing because of certain, uh, 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 let's say, precautions you have not taken, then you have to take those precautions. I mean, there could be, a, you have to check your hydrostatic head, then are you using the correct mud, uh, which is applicable to the strata for stabilizing it? Then if both of these things are correct, then you have to check, you have to go for a casing, as Dr. Sub have said, and uh, if nothing works, then uh, redesign your whole piling system, which has to bear the external load. So that is it. Now, Dr. Sir, we have uh, uh, come up. This was the last question here, but I have, I don't know whether I have a comment or a question. Yeah, no, as I was telling you, this thing, a question has come up here. So I'll ask it here. Many geotech consultants only provide pile load capacity versus pile length. Should, should not, it is compulsory to provide pile spring values at each depth for a better pile design analysis. I think, that, yes, Dr. Stop, question. Yes, sir. that's an absolute responsibility of the geotechnical designer to provide that. Uh, so that has to be provided. Okay, and uh, here again, a question has come up and this question is from, again, and uh, Sir Faraz Manzoor. He's asking in case of abutment pile, if the NSL is too below from the top level of pile or bottom level of transom, we have to use the pier shift. Is it correct or we have to fill up, uh, fill up to the desired level, then construct the pile? Did you get the question, Dr. No, I do not get it. If you can repeat it, maybe. No, uh... I, I will repeat it again. In case of abutment pile, if the natural surface level is too below from the top level of the pile or bottom level of transom, we, we have to use the pier shaft. Is it correct? Or we have to fill up to the desired level, then construct the pile. 
I yeah. couldn't get the question, but please, if you have got it, answer it, please. Yeah, I've got it. Uh, what I, I think what you are trying to say is that uh, many times in case of bridges, the cutoff level of the pile is higher and the natural level of the ground is lower. Uh, and in that case, what is done is that you install a standpipe or you install a liner at the top to reach uh, above the natural ground level, you install that liner to get to your required cutoff level. Uh, there is no harm in doing so, in my opinion. Uh, the only thing that needs to be taken care of by the designer is that uh, that extended part above the natural grade is the one where you will not have any soil surrounding it. So there would not be any skin friction in that part. So that's the only concern. Otherwise, practically, there is, there is no issue there. Earlier to this question, I just missed one question from Shahid uh, Ijaz. He's asking why, why pile capacity curves are made linear, especially when we are designing using SPT and base theories. These are not linear. Do we have to set, uh, do we have to set design and value for all calculations in same strata lithology? What what if we are calculating pile capacities in a multi-layer stratum and there exists weaker compressible layers under strong layers? I, I, I think I think this is a very apt question, very uh, appropriate question. Uh, you one as a designer has to be wary of these things. Yeah. Uh, that if uh, beneath the pile toe, uh, in a certain influence zone beneath the pile toe, uh, there should not be any weak layer. Uh, if there is a weak layer, there is a possibility that uh, if it comes in the zone of influence of the pile, uh, the pile can plunge and it can fail. Uh, the movements can be excessive. Uh, to, to your point of why we are using the linear pile capacity curves, uh, it's not always the case. Uh, uh, probably uh, what happens is that in uh, normally when we are talking about in the greater Punjab area, uh, since they are alluvial deposits, mostly thick sand deposits are there. And as I mentioned here uh, earlier, that uh, pile capacity, the shaft friction is a function of the effective overburden pressure. So as you are going down, since the effective overburden pressure is increasing, so because of the increase in the effective overburden pressure, the pile capacity increases. Uh, but that does not mean that it should always increase linearly. Uh, we often come across cases when there is a sand layer at the top and they, maybe there is a clay layer at the bottom. And in that clay layer, the slope of the line uh, is different compared to the sand layer because it's a much weaker layer. So it's not always the case that it's linear. The, so we, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have to end the question answer session here on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, I still have two questions on the Facebook and th these will be the last two questions. So uh, please don't type any more questions. I won't be able to take them. Thank you. Dr. Saab, uh, we have uh, rather three questions on the Facebook now and quickly answer is four, is 4 p.m. We are one minute over 4 p.m. So mm -hmm. uh, already past our official time, but let's say we, we take these three questions. Hyder Ali Tour on Facebook is asking, because we as geotechnical engineer encountered this problem at almost every project, either you convince client on instrumentation or you take this liability of uncertainty in prediction of load settlement behavior of piles. Anyways, many thanks, sir, for this insightful lecture. This was only a comment. If you want to add anything, talk, sir, please do it quickly. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a self-explanatory thing. I agree that uh, budget constraints and uh, these kind of challenges are always there. Uh, but the point is what needs to be educated to uh, the mass public is that yes, there is an initial investment on putting instrumentation, uh, but there is a greater value that is that can be added to the project in terms of safety and also in case of economy as well. So that investment pays you many fold during the same lifespan of the project. Okay, now uh, staying on Facebook, we have uh, Ahmed Said. Ahmed Said, how are you? I hope you are the same Ahmed Said, Said whom I know. Uh, 
You see, he, he has again posted a comment. Bentonite may be used for polishing the surface of the pile hole while drilling through reverse rotary method of drilling. I think if you want, I mean, that is also self yeah, that's a, yeah. yeah. Now, the, the, this, is the, this is going to be the last question from Mohsen Mahmood Gondal. This is a question. How do you design in peat or organic soil? Do you ignore that part? Ah, huh, that's uh, that's fairly complicated. To be honest, uh, I personally would not be comfortable in uh, taking any resistance from uh, any organic soil. Uh, reason being uh, the deterioration of the material strength over time. So for that reason, I would suggest not to consider the skin friction uh, from that material. Uh, you just bypass that material, go to a deeper depth. Uh, and when you are at a deeper depth, uh, you can probably take advantage of the skin friction from the material that is beyond that uh, organic material. And then obviously you can get benefit of that over resistance uh, if that's there. So that's my personal uh, response to this. Thank you, Doxa. We have come now to the end of the section. Thank you, uh, uh, Ahmed Said. Uh, lovely to see you here. I'm so happy to see you again and remain in touch, please, Ahmed Said. Thank you. Dr. Saab, thank you very much and uh, uh, for this lecture. And you have patiently answered questions to, of all the yeah. participants. And I'm thankful to the participants, particularly today, here uh, on Zoom and also on uh, uh, Facebook. You, uh, you seem to be very knowledgeable yourself, and you have been very inquisitive. I'm really happy to see young engineers asking so many questions. Thank you very much. Dr. Saab, I hope you were also impressed with the yeah. questions or not. Uh, and, uh, I think it was uh, much beyond my expectation, and I'm uh, really happy to see the level of understanding from all these young engineers. Uh, very insightful questions and uh, very useful comments, and I'm very happy to see that. And uh, I would also like to take a moment and appreciate the efforts being done by uh, Tarsa, yourself, and the other team at PSC, because uh, you guys have been the flag bearer uh, of this knowledge dissemination, which is very important for a society like Pakistan. So hats off to you guys, I think, for, for this endeavoring uh, effort. Thank you very much, Oksa, for your uh, nice and kind words and your appreciation. This really gives us a lot of encouragement. So we are already now uh, past 4, uh, 4 p.m. I'll just uh, quickly close the session. Uh, so a few announcements. Next lecture is on 15th July 2023. It is a topic is future proofing the built environment, role of structural engineers. And it would be Dr. Naveed Anwar, who would be our speaker, and he's going to uh, give this lecture from Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, Dr. Saab, you, your shield and your certificate, inshallah, will be dispatched to you either by courier or by some uh, messenger. It will reach uh, uh, your home or your your your, your office uh, in the uh, within this week, and your shield and your certificate. You will receive it very soon. And uh, participants, your certificate should be ready from for collection from 15th June uh, from our office 14A1 Block B Model Town Extension Lahore. And before coming, if you want to confirm, you have to contact uh, Ahmed Akram. Uh, his uh, phone is 0347-462-5111. I repeat, the person to contact is Ahmed Akram. His cell phone is 0347-462-5111. So uh, I, uh, I beg to leave now. I will say goodbye to you. And inshallah, I will see you on 15th July, 2023. God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good.